Good morning and welcome to Essential Ingredients. I'm Justine Reichman, your host, and this morning I have with me Dr. Ben Bickman. Good morning, Dr. Bickman. How are you? Justine, I am doing well. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be able to spend some time talking with you about metabolism, uh, human uh, health, and, and more. I'm so excited too, and this is a little bit of a departure for all of us and a new conversation and a new way to integrate it in the future of food. I'm excited to learn a little bit more from you. So maybe you could just, you know, introduce yourself to our listeners here this morning. Yeah, I am a metabolic scientist uh, and a professor. So as a scientist, I am the, the director of the Metabolism Research Lab here at, at BYU, and I teach an undergraduate class actually about health and disease called pathophysiology, which is basically the sick body. So all the nursing students and many of the pre-med students, they've got to get through Professor Bickman and, <laughs> and get the good grade to be able to move on in life. Uh, and my, my focus in the metabolism research lab is really just to understand human metabolism and what are all the variables that go into it to help it be, to help it work well and, and then have good health as a result. Wow. And we are, and a lot of people are always talking about the metabolism, right? And yeah. how it changes over the, our lives, right? It's faster, it's slower, <clears throat> and how eating changes too, right? So the more mm -hmm. we eat, the less we eat, and how we can change our metabolism. Is that fact or fiction? And how can we change it? Yeah, yeah. So there is some fact and fiction to how we conventionally understand metabolism. It is an overused term. Metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions happening in every cell of the body at, at any moment in time. That is metabolism. And some people do have a higher metabolic rate than other people. The relevance of that metabolic rate is debated. You know, people will typically, they'll start to get older and they'll say, oh, I, I after high school, or after college, I got married, I had kids, and boy, my metabolism slowed down and I gained a lot of weight. There is some evidence that, that we can manipulate our metabolic rate, and maybe that can give a bit of an advantage, um, but that is real, and much of it uh, comes down to what is happening to our hormones, especially insulin. Insulin has a very powerful effect on metabolic rate. So if someone can kind of leverage their insulin, keeping insulin lower, for example, throughout more of the day, then that does accelerate metabolic rate. But metabolic rate matters, but probably not as much as people think. So there's so many things I want to get into with you. And I, and I want to, before we get into maybe you, stories that you can share about how you can manipulate that and how, what you eat does all that. I just want to learn a little bit more about you and how you got into this. Yeah. Yeah. So during my undergraduate, I just had a moment, my undergraduate degree, when I was uh, really concerned about what to do as a career. It, it weighed very, very heavily on my, on my shoulders. And I, part of this was because I was very much interested in being a husband and a father and, and kind of taking care of my family. That was something that I had um, fo been focused on. I, I'd wanted uh, to, to have a family and, and Were you a that. husband and a father at this point? I had just gotten married the okay. last year of my undergraduate degree. And that then was the beginning of sort of an early life crisis. What am I going to do to provide for my future family? And I just had a moment in one of my classes where my professor mentioned, uh, a, a person that I really looked up to, said to the class, I can't stay after class, so ask any questions before class, um, because right after class I have to leave to go, you know, coach one of my, you know, children's um, athletic events or something. And I just was so struck by that, and, I, and it made me start looking at all of my professors and realizing that they really had a wonderful work life balance, you know, and, and in, a, in a word, if I were to sum up what it's like to be a professor and, and what I hoped it would be at the time and what it really is, it's freedom. There's so much freedom that comes with this profession to, to really have a freedom of schedule uh, and, and a freedom of, of curiosity, what I do in my lab, what are the questions I ask and, and how I spend my time and, and kind of what I do, what I do with my time when I come and go. And that was the beginning of, of me wanting to pursue academia. And then it was a matter of, all right, well, what am I going to pursue 
to become a professor. And it was me really leaning into this interest in, in human health and metabolism. And then the more I learned, the more I became interested in fat cells. And so that's actually how I describe myself nowadays. I'm a fat cell biologist. I understand <laughs> fat cells and it's a very relevant focus. Uh, people might think that means I only know about um, getting fat cells big and small. I know a lot about that, but when fat cells get too big, it starts to send messages throughout the body that start to promote other problems and other <clears throat> tissues of the bodies like the brain or the liver or the ovaries uh, problems. Once the fat cells get a little sick, they start kind of spreading that. Wow. Okay. So I want to go back to, uh, um, we started to get into some of the impacts of what you're eating and how it impacts your metabolism. And I wanted to just share with the listeners your story. So we didn't really get into those uh, stories you were talking about in terms of the metabolism and mm -hmm. what you eat and how it impacts uh, your metabolism. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Because that's oh, sure. a really big topic for people and how we, we often say that, you know, starving our body, how that impacts our metabolism, uh -huh. right? By not eating, oh, I'm not going to eat till this time or um, I've been eating so much, you know, I have a fast metabolism. So, you know, are these facts, are they, are they fads? Are they, you know, it, is it a myth? Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And then maybe share some stories of how people have um, changed their metabolism, if that's something they can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so metabolic rate uh, is very much uh, modifiable. We can absolutely manipulate our metabolic rate. And this can be, of course, it's obviously influenced when we just get up and get physically active. When we go out on a run or something, obviously our metabolic rate goes up because we're just doing more. There are more metabolic reactions. There's more chemical reactions occurring. And that would, of course, accelerate metabolic rate as opposed to just sitting and doing nothing that would slow down metabolic rate. So there's that obvious influence there. But beyond that, if we put that to the side, and what I alluded to earlier, I'll come back to now, if someone is increasing their insulin levels by eating, well, maybe I should even back up. So insulin is a hormone that we all have flowing through our blood, unless we are a type one diabetic. In type one diabetes, a person is no, long, is no longer making insulin and they must then inject insulin every day in order to survive. For the rest of us, we're making insulin all the time. And when insulin, insulin will go up, if blood glucose starts to go up. And so, and of course, blood glucose will go up if we start to eat a lot of refined sugars and starches. So a lot of, when there's a lot of glucose coming into the blood from sugar and starch, you know, things like bread or cereal, potato chips, or just candy, then the glucose will go really high and insulin will come and in, glucose can't stay high for too long. That's dangerous. So insulin comes from the pancreas and it basically opens the doors into the cells to allow the glucose to go out of the blood and into the cells of our bodies, of the, yeah, of, the, of our body. And when, when glucose comes down, then insulin comes back down. But insulin, again, just to kind of reiterate, goes up if the glucose demands that it come up. And if someone is eating a diet that is keeping their insulin high, then their metabolic rate will slow down by about 100 calories per day based on where it would have been before that. However, if they are eating foods that keep their insulin low, in other words, avoiding um, refined starches and sugars, then their metabolic rate will go up about 180 calories per day based on where it would have been before, uh, you know, throughout a normal day of eating. Does age foods. play any part in this? <clears throat> Well, probably, uh, although this study that I'm citing right now didn't look at the influence of age, but in general, metabolic rate will go down with age simply because we have less um, high metabolic rate tissue. Our muscle mass starts to decline and, uh, and muscle is such a main driver of kind of resting normal metabolic rate that as we start to lose muscle, it stands to reason that metabolic rate will come down too, but that doesn't have to happen. Someone, one of the tragedies is of, of our kind of long-lived societies is just this kind of grim acceptance. Well, I'm going to get older and I'm going to gain weight. No, that is something we ought to fight. And I believe <clears throat> uh, I might be getting too far ahead in the conversation now, but to me, the, 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 the best way to control 
Um, insulin, which I believe is very important beyond metabolic rate. Um, in fact, let me pause there for just a sec. Uh, controlling insulin is pivotal to almost every chronic disease. If someone is living a life that continues to spike their insulin all the time, mm -hmm then they will start to become what's called insulin resistant. And that is a fundamental cause of diseases like heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, the most common form of infertility in women is also fundamentally a disease of insulin resistance. So there is the, the relevance of controlling insulin so, really extends so talk to, to me, almost so talk every to me disease. Talk about the foods that we can avoid in our diet to change that, right? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. We have an opportunity to look at our diet, to change what we're eating, to directly impact this, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. This what, is, thank what heavens. What are the top things that we should think about changing in our diet mm -hmm. so that we can change the impact of this? Yeah, right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, my philosophy when it comes to nutrition and, and food is to nourish the body while keeping insulin in control. So try to prevent insulin from spiking all day throughout the day. And that, that happens. The average person, they wake up in the morning and breakfast is a starchy, sugary mess. I'm thinking I you know, should not eat my croissant that I just bought. Yeah, yeah, well, there you go. I mean, good good example. It's it's a croissant or it's bagels or it's cereal and they spike their insulin to several times normal. And then the insulin will take anywhere from two to three hours to come back down. Of course, by the time it's coming down, they have their mid-morning snack, then they have lunch and then they have an afternoon snack. And every waking moment is spent in state elevated insulin. And that starts to make the body fatter and sicker. And back to the fat cells that I've mentioned earlier, my focus on fat cells, you cannot have a fat cell shrink if insulin is up. And in contrast, a fat cell will grow. Insulin is like fertilizer to fat cells. Mm. Insulin directly stimulates the growth of fat cells and inhibits the fat cells from breaking down its fat to be used for energy and thus shrink. So someone who wants to control their weight or lose weight, one of the fundamental strategies is to help keep insulin low. So get off that constant roller coaster of insulin. But most people today, unfortunately, spend every waking moment in a state of elevated insulin. Okay. So what are we telling them? To, what do we recommend they eat to keep their yeah. insulin low and right. to be healthy and to keep their metabolism in check? What are yep. we recommending here? Yeah. What the, so what are the workarounds? Mm -hmm. So for me, I break it down into kind of three, maybe we'll say four simple uh, strategies. And I do think they're simple. Not That's not to say they're easy though, <laughs> because it's hard to change diet. It's hard to change foods, but I do think they're simple. But the first one, we need to control carbohydrates. And that's not to say we don't eat them at all. I'm not saying that. But if, if these are processed carbohydrates like breads, cereals, crackers, sweets, those are not good and they have a significant effect on our insulin. So we just need to control the carbohydrates and be, and be smart about how we consume them. Focus more on fruits and vegetables, but eat them, don't drink them. Fruit oh. juice and smoothies, they have a very different effect. There was a study that had people eat just blueberries and then ate just the fruit, just the juice of that same amount of blueberries. And the insulin effect was significantly different between the two. So we eat the fruits and vegetables. We don't drink them. Wow, I'd love you to share that study with me after. Maybe you could just mm -hmm. email it to me so we can include it in the show notes for yeah. our listeners. Yeah, because it, I yeah, it was a study a in type two people, diabetics. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of people, including myself, we do a lot of juicing, and I think just sh being able to share that information with our listeners so that they can dig a little deeper into it, you know, so that they can make an informed choice themselves. Yeah. I'm by no means an expert, but I do want to be able to provide the information so that the listeners here can be able to take that information and make more informed choices. Yeah. And I'm okay with your listeners just saying, well, forget you, Ben. I'm not going to, I like my juicing too much. I that's would say okay. that's fine, but there is, there may be a consequence to that. And if a person finds that they're struggling with their weight, um, that might be a very simple strategy just to say, all right, well, I'm going to juice less and then just eat the fruits and vegetables rather than juice. But I get it. Juicing and smoothies, they are delicious. They are so yummy, <laughs> but they, it, there might be unintended consequences. So that's the first rule to me, control carbohydrates. Just be smart about it. The second one is to prioritize protein. The more people are eating processed foods, 
most processed foods, what they have removed other than the fiber is the protein. That is a problem. Protein promotes greater satiety than any of the other foods we can eat. So it would tell the brain to stop eating. And it actually accelerates metabolic rate more than any. A protein has a high cost of digestion. When we eat protein, the body works a little more than normal to digest it. And metabolic rate goes up, actually. It's something called the thermic effect of food. When we eat this food and we just feel a little warmer, perhaps. Are there any from... downsides to having a high protein diet? Uh, no, but it, that's a good question. And it's something that is uh, very debated. Some of the fears classically had been that high protein will cause cancer. And that is completely unjustified. There is no convincing evidence. There's no evidence to support that idea. Some people will invoke a, a book called The China Study, which I consider one of the greatest travesties of science uh, ever written, maybe. Uh, I don't believe there's any validity to the claims that protein is going to cause cancer. Um, it, it, that's one of the worries. And then any other claim that it's going to hurt your kidneys, that's, a, a fab, that's false. That's been proven false. And I don't know what the other claims would be. Now, I'm not saying someone should only be eating protein. That's not healthy. But we need to make sure we're getting enough. But before, for... you, before you go on, there's a variety of different kinds of protein. We're not only talking mm -hmm. about steak. Um, yeah. You have a lot of different kinds of protein that are not yeah. actually meat. Um, well, that's right. So yep, that's right. I don't think and I'm happy to be... elaborate on that. No, I'm just saying it doesn't necessarily need to be meat. It could be plant forward. Um, it yeah. could be, I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of protein that there are. people can focus on and include in their diets. Yep. I mean, I am a meat eater, but Me I don't too. think people need to be meat eaters or even fish eaters or, I mean, they can incorporate it in a variety of ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, there are multiple proteins. I will say that um, it, this won't be, I will say it uh, very diplomatically, but I, and I hope it won't upset any listeners. Um, there is no question that animal source proteins are superior to any plant protein. There's no question. The, the, the profile of amino acids is superior in any animal protein, whether it's meat or dairy or eggs. The amino acid profile is superior and the digestion is superior. Plant proteins, every plant protein, pea, uh, pumpkin seed, soy, has chemicals in them called anti-nutrients. And this sounds mythical, but I encourage anyone to look it up. This is published research. These proteins uh, come with things called trypsin inhibitors or tannins or phytic acids that will prevent some of the digestion of that plant protein. Not to say they can't get these amino acids. You absolutely can, but you will get less. And some of these plant proteins come with high levels of heavy metals. I encourage anyone to look up something called the Clean Label Project, where this third party um, evaluated the composition of metals in protein supplements, and the biggest offenders were plant proteins. And that's just a natural result of what we do. When we try to get protein from a pea, a pea, any plant, is very, very low protein levels. The plants aren't intended to be sources of protein, but when we've made them into sources of protein. We have to take, you know, a thousand peas and we concentrate all that protein from a thousand peas in order to get a, a serving of protein. We unintentionally are concentrating the natural metals or minerals that are in peas, for example, or any other plant protein. And this is things like lead and arsenic. And this third party group found potentially toxic levels of heavy metals in plant protein. So anyone who's trying to get all of their protein strictly from plants, I would, I, I feel compelled to just say, be careful. That is not a normal way. Our um, humans aren't meant to get protein from plants. We aren't ruminants. We don't have all the stomachs and the um, microbiome culture that ruminants have, that they can get all their um, proteins from plants like a cow or a goat or a horse. We aren't built that way. Um, and so I do think there's a note of caution. And I say this somewhat, it's hard for me not to mention this because as a university professor, one of the most common I consider eating disorders I see is, is college age students, often females who decide to follow a vegan diet and, and the consequences are disastrous. 
uh, what are some it, of the consequences you see? Can you share a story? Of oh, gladly, gladly. Yes, I'm happy to elaborate on this. But again, I hope anyone listening, please know I, I don't speak this in any with any ill intent. It is strictly out of um, scientific curiosity and a genuine concern. Um, a, a vegan diet is incompatible with human life. If a person is strictly following a vegan diet, they will die. I can say that with absolute certainty. Now, I will say a vegan diet is a privilege of the elite because a person has to know what they will be deficient in. And I'll elaborate more on that in a moment because you will be deficient in, in essential nutrients on a vegan diet. But, but if you know what you're deficient in, then you may be also lucky enough to be able to afford the supplements to make up for it. So for example, a person who follows a strict vegan diet will become iron deficient and will suffer from iron deficiency anemia, which is why so many vegans are on iron supplements to try to make up for that deficiency. Because someone can say, well, I can get all my iron from broccoli. No, you can't. It's the wrong kind of iron and it's, there's not nearly enough of it to make up for this being the wrong kind of iron. You cannot get enough iron from plants. Second, you won't get enough vitamin B12 you cannot get B12 from any plant. It is impossible. You have to take a supplement. And in this, this results in, so the iron deficiency will result in what's called an iron deficiency anemia. The B12 deficiency will result in something called pernicious anemia. Once again, it's a problem of blood cells, but also um, not only red blood cells, but immune cells. And in fact, that happens in adults. And it can happen in, in a, if a woman is breastfeeding and she's following a vegan diet, it will start to develop in her child as well. Uh, so it, this is, uh, so two different types of anemias. And then lastly, the person will be deficient in, in omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, there are benefits to the omega-3 fatty acids you can get from things like flax and chia. There are metabolic benefits from that, but it doesn't convert into the essential um, amino acids that we need for brain function in addition to other cells, which which is EPA and DHA. You have to get that from animal sources or um, uh, algae. If someone is eating algae oil, they can get enough of those essential omega-3 fatty acids. So, so Ben, just to recap for a minute, what you're saying is that it's not that people will die from being vegan if they take these supplements. It's the people that don't, it's, it's the one person, it's not the one percenters that are being vegan and supplementing. It's the people without the resources to be able yes. to supplement, to be able to have the knowledge, to be able to figure out what it is that's missing in their diet, to be mm -hmm, able to make mm -hmm. sure that they have all the nutrients and the vitamins that they need that they're not getting on the vegan diet. That's right. Now, some people don't care. Self is not enough. Is that right? I, that's well said. Yes. That's okay, why I say that. We're just going to take a short break uh, to have a word from our sponsors and then we'll be right back. I want to thank today's sponsor, Next Gen Chef. Next Gen Chef feeds members with the knowledge and tools that they need to create concepts with purpose and succeed. If you're listening today, they are offering a one-year subscription for any new founder that wants to participate at a special discounted rate. For more information, email team at nextgenchef.com. If you're interested in becoming a member or just a part of the community, email nextgenchef at team at nextgenchef.com. You can also follow them on Instagram at nextgenchef, as well as on LinkedIn, and on Facebook. Thank you again, Next Gen Chef, for making this podcast possible. Together, we can change the future of food. So we're back here. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, so, Ben, uh, I just want to circle back to a couple of things uh, as we move forward in the second half of our show here and let our listeners get to know you just a little bit better. I know you have a book coming out, so I want them to get to know you and what inspired you to get into this. And I know you talked a little bit about your family. Uh, you talked a little bit about building, uh, you know, what to do with your life and what your work would be. So a lot of this is about building a healthier life. And I just would love for you to share with everyone what inspired you to do this and what your hope is for the future of food and how these connect with your book that's coming out. 
Right. Yeah. Well, in fact, full disclosure, the book is now out. Oh, okay. So anyone, no. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the book uh, is is called Why We Get Sick. And that book uh, is, is basically a, a primer on insulin resistance, what it is, why it matters, um, where it comes from. In other words, what are, how, what's causing it, and then what to do about it. So it ends kind of on that happy note, which, which is uh, really true that if someone has insulin resistance, I, I kind of lay out a plan to try to determine whether they, a way to find out whether they think they, whether they have it. And then it's, it's, it's such a, a changeable variable in their health. If someone has insulin resistance, they can start to reverse that within a day and continue to see improvements in the following weeks and profound improvements. And, and that has consequences far beyond just insulin resistance. You know, someone hears the term insulin resistance and thinks, well, I don't know what that is and why should I even care? And it's because you care about it because of what I mentioned earlier. It is so fundamental to virtually every chronic disease, you know, infertility, hypertension, fatty liver disease, migraine okay, so you headaches. You got to share a story with us. Do you have one about infertility or? Oh yeah. Or, you know, something that where people can see the impact and the change mm -hmm. by making these adjustments in their life. Yeah. So uh, it, one of my great delights is that I have shared the story with enough local doctors, physicians, and, and they have started implementing some of these policies in their clinical practice. And we published a paper with this clinic last year where we took 11 women with full-blown type 2 diabetes. And the clinical visit basically went something like this. This is the conversation that my physician friend had with these diabetic women as they were newly diagnosed. It was basically you can leave the office with a prescription for diabetes medications, which will never end. That's so important that people realize if someone is taking a medication, say, for example, to fight their type 2 diabetes, they will never get off the medication. They will be on it for the rest of their lives. Or the alternative was you change your diet, and then we can hopefully totally reverse the disease. These 11 women that we published in this case study took the diet course. That's why we followed them. We found that within 90 days, their type 2 diabetes was completely gone. There was zero evidence anymore. Their glucose had come normal, their hypertension, they lost about 20 pounds, incidentally. They had every improvements in their blood lipids, their triglycerides came down, their HDL cholesterol went up. Those are both considered very good changes. And this just happened within 90 days. Wow. And they, the, the diabetes diagnosis was reversed. We had we had cured the diabetes. These women had cured their diabetes by simply following those kind of three nutritional pillars that I laid out earlier, which is all focused on just lowering insulin. The same physician friend has helped numerous women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So women who would start this and within months get pregnant after having tried unsuccessfully for years. And that's because polycystic ovarian syndrome, once again, is fundamentally a problem of of insulin resistance and how it affects the ovaries and the ovaries production of sex hormones. And then they were able to start um, going on a normal menstrual cycle again and um, get successfully pregnant. Another uh, last story I'll share. Okay, I could keep like going. Stories here. I, I have a colleague about six doors down the hallway here. And he, he was talking with me one time. I'd seen him and he just looked miserable. And I said, you aren't looking too good. What's up? And he said, oh, I'm in the midst of a terrible migraine headache. I get about one or two a week, and it typically kind of really lays me down for 24 hours or so. And I mentioned to him the long history of research. <clears throat> and this is over 100 years ago. We have published human evidence from humans to find that if you put someone on a diet that, like I outlined earlier, that puts the carbohydrates low or in control and focuses more on protein and fat, in other words, improving insulin, then the migraine headaches get significantly better and in many instances stop entirely. And so I mentioned this to him. I shared the research with him and he said, I'm going to give it a try. And then I, I didn't see him for a little while after, you know, our schedules don't always align. And I saw him probably, I don't know, six weeks later. And I said, hey, what's going on? You look good. And he had lost weight. He wasn't particularly overweight to begin with. And he said, oh, Ben, this has just been transformational. He said, I went from having about one bad migraine a week. And he said, now I have it based on what I'm seeing about one a month. And so a, 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 an enormous change in him. 
and and it, it continues. This was months ago already, and it, it keeps getting better and better and better for him. And you think about the quality of life change for him, what this means with his, with his career, time with his family, and it has been a significant improvement. And there's so much incredible nuance when it comes to the brain health, migraines, seizures, my, uh, Alzheimer's disease, where it, it's, it's really kind of an intricate uh, energy disruption where the brain starts to become resistant to insulin and now it can't get as much glucose in to feed its metabolic rate. And then the brain starts to suffer. So um, that's a rabbit hole that I won't go down. So numerous, numerous um, reports of people, some that we've published um, to suggest the power of shifting the diet to, to be one that helps insulin come down. When insulin is down, everything gets better. Wow, that's amazing. And I feel like you're going to help so many people. Are there any emerging trends that you're seeing? I mean, I know that there, we're talking about diabetes, and I know that we're talking about infertility. But are there any other emerging trends that you see that you're going to be investigating and working on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are starting more studies uh, with help, helping people learn to use something called continuous glucose monitors. Mm -hmm. And continuous glucose monitors, let me just pull off my jacket and I'll show you what I mean. These are these little kind of wearable oh. devices that, that just embed a teeny little kind of wire. You can't feel it at all oh, into embed your skin. A wire into us? Yeah, but it's, it, it, you don't, I mean, it sounds scary, but it's, it's nothing. That's very scary. I was thinking maybe we could just embed it in the Apple watch. Well, it might get to that point actually. So I know Apple is pursuing this, but basically what I do, this will constantly be communicating with my phone and you just literally like push it on and you don't feel it at all. And it's so teeny and constantly my phone will be telling me what my glucose level is, my blood glucose at any minute of the day. And that is transformational and that this company that I've been working with is called Levels, but basically what, what, they, what it enables the person to do is see any food they eat, what is happening to their glucose, how high did it get, how long did it stay high, did it go really low afterwards, you know, an hour or two later, making the person get hungry again. And when, when someone can see these kind of glucose changes in real time, it naturally starts changing their behavior. They would look at that, you know, they look at that croissant and say, oh my goodness, that croissant bumped my glucose up to 180 and my glucose level stayed high for two hours. But when okay, I so ate- I'm not going to eat the croissant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll quit, I'll quit, I'll quit picking on you. I'll quit that, picking that's on you. off the table now. <laughs> yeah. But in contrast, a person would say maybe eat some cheese or eat some, some like an omelet with vegetables and, you know, onions and tomatoes and cheese right. and eggs. And they would see that their glucose level didn't move at all. You know, the, a modest little bump and then it just kept on moving. And they'd, they'd look at that and say, wow, that's a much, my body responded much better to that food than say, the, you know, the bagels or the two bowls of cereal. And so that's, that's one of the projects I'm, I'm really excited about now, um, trying to see how people can start leveraging these modern technologies to help them start making changes of their own volition. You know, it's not that someone's enforcing a dietary change. They look at this and just conclude naturally, this isn't good. I don't want to, I don't want to see that. Uh, and, and so they just make their own changes. Have you heard of a sparkling water called Good Idea? The Good Idea or Good Idea? No, never. Idea. So uh -uh. you have to Google it. Um, I'd be okay. curious to just- I love, that. I love um, soda, uh, club soda, like sparkling water. So Good Idea was actually made by a scientist. They're, they're the same people that um, made oatly milk. They're out of uh, Norway or Sweden. Um, so if you look up Good Idea water, it balances your blood sugar. And the reason I'm telling you about this, because it's a, it's a Swedish uh, sugar buster. It's sparkling water with amino acids and chromium. Mm, I see. Mm -hmm. And I just thought for somebody in this field, this could be something interesting for you to know about. Equally, there may be an opportunity for you guys to do something together. Um, if it's interesting to you, if it's interesting to them, what you're doing, you know, I'm always looking to connect people that are in yeah, the yeah. industry is looking to change the future of food um, and yeah. uh, offer people new solutions. Yeah, that looks, that looks great. I, a, right? A, a so, oh yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of getting sufficient amino acids. That's kind of back to my prioritized protein aspect. Right. So one and, of the co-founders or founders of this, his name is Bjorn Ost. 
He was one of the co-founders of Oatly. Um, he lives here in Marin County as well. And we've had him on some of our talks that we've done. He's a wealth of knowledge and he's He's, he's one of the founders of this product and he's really done a great job. Uh, him and his team, uh, they've developed really innovative products that are really changing the future of food. And I'm super impressed by them. And everybody that I've shared them with is super impressed. And the science behind them is really innovative and changing things and giving people great opportunities to really, I mean, by drinking this after a meal, you level out your sugar. It gives you more energy. I mean, you don't get that slump. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. a walking advertisement for it, really. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't even get a kickback. Yeah, yeah. But it, that being said, I just thought it was a relevant thing to bring up in this conversation based on the com based on what we're talking about. Right. Um, yeah. So I thought I'd share it with you. If you're interested, I can always connect you. Um, Thank you. He's really great. They're doing lots of really interesting stuff. Um, so check them out and let me know. Um, but let's get back to you and what you're doing and the changes you're making in the future of food. Uh, so um, that we can share that with our listeners because I think it's really interesting. And I wanna be able for, I wanna share with them the things that, the, the things that you have to offer. So tell me, has COVID played an impact on what you're doing and, and the things that you're, how, the trajectory that you have set now for the going forward? Yeah. So COVID boy, what a, what a beast uh, this is and, and what it has been on the world. COVID isn't directly affecting me, thank heavens or my family, other than limitations with the kid's school. But as a scientist, I cannot help but be very interested just because of what the data suggest. And as much as people want to invoke science and invoke data, I'll do a little bit of it now. Um, we know that COVID does not affect all people the same way. And that's true of any disease, but more than other viral infections, COVID appears to have a greater impact on people who are suffering from poor metabolic health. And I say this based on the data we got early on in this, especially from New York, that we found that uh, almost everyone, uh, like 90, 94% of everyone who had a bad COVID infection, had pre-existing conditions and often more than one. On average, they had almost three pre-existing conditions on average. And again, that would this is the, 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 the distinguishing feature between someone having a mild infection, if they noticed at all, or a very bad infection. And those pre-existing conditions in order are obesity, hypertension, and type two diabetes. Those are all metabolic problems. And it, there's an inter, there's a fascinating connection between COVID-19 and fat cells. Um, and maybe I don't want to get into too much of the detail for the sake of time, but but it, it's increasingly obvious if someone has too much fat on their bodies, COVID is going to be generally much worse than what it would be otherwise. And there are some kind of cellular mechanisms that explain that connection, but I, I won't get into that. The evidence is clear. Um, if if we want to well, to me, the evidence is clear in multiple ways. One, this virus is not going away. We will never eradicate it. It is now a new part of the global ecosystem. So two, we should try to control our own health to try to improve our immune defenses. And so my sentiment is let's really address improving metabolic health so that when we inevitably get infected, we can, we can beat it more easily than otherwise. I think that's super smart. I mean, who wouldn't want to be able to do that, right? I mean, that, yeah, yeah. And to be able to have the tools to do it, I think, is what everybody wants. Everybody's looking for a fix, a solution, how we can support our immune systems and be healthier so that should we get infected with it, um, we can have a better shot at yep. your recovery. Yep. So I appreciate you sharing that. So um, just as we wrap up, I'd love to be able to maybe just go through a couple tips that you might have for, I know that this is not necessarily in your wheelhouse, but mm -hmm. a couple of tips as new food and beverage entrepreneurs are building their, their, the, this food system for us, right? And you're talking about the body and the systems that we have within us. And so what should they consider as they're building their products? What should they can, you know, so that they can create and support a healthier food system? Could you give us three mm -hmm. tips? Yeah. Yeah. So my, 
That, that's a great question. And I cannot speak to the most sustainable ways, you know, for example, yeah. like you, when you and I first started chatting, you had a, a wonderful expression from soil to shelf. I think I love that perspective. And so I can't speak to that. My, my sentiment is I can only speak to what happens once the food gets in the person's body and okay. how that will influence their body. And I Equally would, I would then Equally as important. <laughs> Oh, well, well, sure. Well, uh, it's just the only thing I can lean into. And I would just say, I would encourage people as they're imagining products, new products, revisions of products, I would, I would just whisper to them. I want their little conscience to be whispering to them. What would this do to someone's insulin? And there are benign, there are seemingly benign things. Like for example, someone would say, well, I'm going to use stevia because stevia is a sweetener that will have less of an insulin effect than sugar. That is absolutely true. But most stevia supplements, if they're buying little packets of stevia from the grocery store and they rip open the stevia and pour it in their drink or whatever, actually the bulk of that stevia is just pure glucose. It's powdered glucose, which will go right into the bloodstream and spike the insulin. So the stevia itself isn't a problem at all. It would be what's coming with it. Not that anyone listening is a stevia manufacturer making these supplements. I would just say, look at wonder what that food or product might be doing to a person's insulin. And I would just say, maybe rely on those three pillars. And maybe those are my three tips. Control carbohydrates. So be smart about the starches and the sugars, prioritize the best proteins. And then my last one that I didn't end up getting around to actually, don't fear fat. Humans are built to eat fat. And, and that is animal fats and fruit fats. And the fruit fats are coconuts, olives, avocados. We've been eating these sources of fats for millennia. And it's the new fake oils, as I call them, these seed oils, things like soybean oil, canola oil, cottonseed, um, I don't, corn oil. Those are unnatural and not healthy at all. And yet they find their way into almost every packaged food. Soybean oil has become the single most commonly consumed fat in the Western diet, and it, that should not be the case. So we should focus. Don't fear fat. Fat is very nutritious. It has no effect on insulin. We need it. It is essential, but focus on the animal fats and the fruit fats, not the seed oils. Those are, those are industrial oils that have no place in human diets. Okay. Thank you for that. I think they'll, I think our listeners will appreciate those three tips. And, and I know you had mentioned uh, some recipes that you guys, you and your family or your brother, I believe, uh, yeah, yeah. been making during this, during the pandemic. So maybe you can go through that quickly so that we can share that with our listeners. And equally, we will then include that in our show notes for those that uh, want to then make it. Yeah, great. So um, in fact, at the very beginning of the year, before COVID actually, so it was a terrible time to start a new business. One, um, two of my older brothers and I, and I actually have uh, seven older brothers, so it's not, Is it's that not all, all of them. <laughs> yeah. So two of my older brothers and I um, were looking at meal replacement shakes and just uh, weren't overly impressed, at least none that were fitting the rules, the three kind of pillars and so that I outlined earlier. So we just started making our own. And anyone, I, I won't oversell it here. Basically, it is um, a low carbohydrate, but it rich with fiber, low carbohydrate, high protein and high fat. And, and that is intended, that's deliberate. We actually put a one-to-one -one amount of protein to fat to match some of the most nutritious foods like an egg has, for example. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And we added extra little things like apple cider vinegar, um, some prebiotic fibers and, and probiotics. And again, anyone who's listening who wants to learn more, please just go to Get Health. And health is spelled H-L-T-H. -H. We didn't have time for the E and the A. So Get <laughs> Health, H-L-T-H.com -H uh, to learn more about the shake. Um, but th it's, it's a wonderful meal replacement shake. I'm very proud of it. Uh, but it's fun as I use this in my home because I'm very much mindful of what to how to best feed my children. And we will sometimes make uh, waffles from it. And I just take two scoops of the shake. And then I think it was about six eggs and then a little bit of a baking powder. And I just blend it up and then put it in the waffle iron. Oh, so it's actually a protein powder that you made. It's not actually like, it's not like you make it uh, from oh, it's the- It's a meal replacement. It's yep, a meal yep, replacement. A, oh, so you actually made this- it's a product mm -hmm. that you created. It's a new project. Yeah. So people can go and buy this. 
Okay, great. Yeah. Is there any sort of coupon code that you have? For yeah, us? sure. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Yeah, anyone listening, just enter the coupon code BEN10 and yes. you can just get 10% off any order. Yeah, awesome. it's a, give it a try. Uh, it's it's really fun. Uh, it's it's a great shake. It's been a fun project to start to do with my brothers. And it's been wonderful seeing so many people improve, especially um, to see as people are measuring their glucose levels uh, and they see that this it doesn't do anything. The glucose levels just stay nice and flat. Uh, because we follow those three pillars that I outlined earlier. It's, it has been a fun project, but I'll say starting a business during COVID-19 <laughs> is not the best time to start a business. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, do you but have things are going fine. Well, that's great to hear. Do you have uh, a new pro a next project that you have planned or is this what you're focused on for the moment? Yeah, this is definitely the main focus. I'm also working. Uh, so my book, anyone who's curious, please go anywhere books are sold. I'm, I'm really wanting to increase the awareness of the book. And the name of the book is Why We Get Sick. And again, it's just this general idea that the sooner we understand insulin resistance, the better we can address chronic diseases and, and be healthier as a result. So between the shake and the book and the busy family life and career mm -hmm. as a scientist. You're pretty busy, that's huh? An, that's enough for now, yeah. Awesome, Ben. Thanks so much for joining us today. I want to thank our listeners too for joining us. If you like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to Essential Ingredients. Uh, you can download our episodes on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, et cetera, and all the rest. Uh, we are sponsored in part by Next Gen Chef, and we are here every week, and we hope to see you again soon. I want to thank my guests and my listeners for joining me today at Essential Ingredients. If you like this episode and you want to make sure not to miss any others, please subscribe. You can find us on all the large channels, including iTunes. And I hope that you'll make sure to follow us and share it with your friends. For more information about essential ingredients, you can check out the website justinereichman.com. You can follow myself on Instagram and Facebook at Justine Reichman. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Next Gen Chef and the platform that powers this podcast, you can find us at nextgenchef.com on Instagram, Facebook, and all the other social media outlets. I hope to hear from you and see you again soon.